UndergroundHipHopBlog.com exclusive. One, two, one, two, what up? It's Pause One representing UndergroundHipHopBlog.com out here in Orange County, California at the Slide Bar, as you can see, with the very talented Buku One. What's up, Buku? Not much, man. Just hanging out. We got a nice, cool free show for folks. So, if you know, Dell gives back. So, we like to do free shows every now and then just to let people know and have a good time, you know? Dope. I just heard right now they're at capacity. So, I mean, it's, it's crazy to even see somebody throw a free show. So, big shout out to the Slide Bar doing their thing. Uh, I wanted to talk to you about a few things. Actually, off camera, we were talking about a few things. Um, the whole graph lifestyle, because it's Buku One. I go by Pause One. A lot of people don't know that comes from the whole graph. So if you want to break that down, being a graph writer and things like that, how, how you got influenced and became an MC? I mean, I grew up skateboarding, and then I got been skating since 87, got into graffiti about 91. So that was like my second love before rapping and any of that stuff. So, you know, Buku One came from that, obviously, one Graffiti writers put the one on there to emphasize they're the one and only person using that name and so on and so forth. So, you know, and my whole, I grew up under Dream from TDK, rest in peace. And um, those guys in the Bay and Dream really instilled the concept of letters to me. Like, you know, your colors could be cool and your characters and all that could be cool, but your letters is what makes it graffiti art. So your letters should be the foundation of your piece. So he really ingrained that. So I really, to this day, really focus on letters. You know, emphasize letters, man. He's like, you, you, he's like, you should have a tight silver and black that should be able to burn anything in the yard. That's your goal. And then when you add the, your colors, it goes from there. So just being that way and being in graffiti all the way from bombing to kind of moving out of bombing to doing. Once I started bombing through the rhyme, it wasn't really logical to be out bombing at night and then, you know, having my name on a, a flyer and stuff with my name and stuff like that. So, but the concept of graffiti writers really looking at different ways to get up, to get their name out there. Um, translates perfectly into MCing because you're trying to find your lane, why, ways to get your name out. Because there's hella graffiti artists all over the world, right? Hella MCs everywhere. So you got to find a way to stand out. And it may not be the wildest or the crazy or the dopest, but you got you to think on your toes. And I, one thing I did take is I took the concept of being clean and having clean funk letters into rhyming. Like, you know, rhyming fast and stuff here and there and chopping is cool because it's like a wild style, right? But when you're entertaining the crowd, you got to be able to reel them in so they can figure out what you're doing first. So I really like, I like the I like Master A special ed type rhyming. Personally, for me, that, that's that's who I'm inspired by. I'm amazed by, you know, my folks like Project Blow and all those guys. I'm amazed by that. But I know my lane is not that lane. Like, my lane is much more conveying a message of being able to have them follow me. Um, you know, so I'm really into that, and that's kind of how it translated. I love that analogy because I, I, I've used that before as far as like people, people like as far as a business tip, because some people like with graph writers, you can get up everywhere, but be toy. And then you got some cats that like that kill black books, but don't ever get up. And it's just like right. I, I use that business analogy, but it's dope because you're saying having a certain style where it's it's a. Uh, it's easy to translate, easy to read. Because right. I remember doing graph and people were like, I like it, but I can't read it. Right. You know what I mean? And those are for like the laymen's and people that don't, don't understand graph. So that's a real dope analogy. Yeah. I wanted to talk to you about the name. The name is, is extremely dope. I know what it means if you want to break that down for the people real quick. You know, the, the slang buku comes from the French word beaucoup. Beaucoup meaning a lot. Like merci beaucoup, thank you very much. But in the south, like New Orleans and all them through the Haitians like that, they use it. And so... My uncle was telling me about it. I was writing some other name before, and somebody suggested I write Buku, and I was like, what's that? And he didn't really tell me. He was just like, just write it. He was like an older graffiti artist. Had a, yeah, he, he, he meant well. It just didn't come off well. It came off like, fuck, you write it. You know, but then I started hearing it, and my uncle was like, man, Buku in the 70s, the word was like, that was the word for like a large amount, a massive, just abundant amount of something. Like, he had Buku bucks or you know, like stuff like that. And so I was like, oh, okay, well, because I skateboard. And, you know, I'm thinking at that time that, you know, I was a graffiti artist, I had hella styles. Hope Maybe I was thinking I would eventually have because I, I didn't have them then. But so it was like boo cool one, like man of many, you know. And so now it's more, it makes more sense now because I skateboard, do graffiti, rhyme, a little bit of production, bowling, you know, management, you know, whatever else you need to do to sustain your life. So that's how it came about. Let's talk about the album Autonomy. Yeah. And, and I don't know if people out there know what autonomy is. Hopefully, if you're watching Underground Hip Hop Blog, you know what autonomy is. If you could break it down, the album, the production, the rhymes and things like that for the people out there. Well, yeah, autonomy is, you know, I guess I won't tell you because he wants you to look it up. So I won't tell you what it means. But basically, this is the first self-produced album I've done. 
Um, Dell had been riding me for years and years to years. So was like, start using Ableton Live and really get into production. I was just resisting. So I was like, I don't have time. Like, I'm doing this, this, and that. And he was like, you don't understand how, you know. So I finally got into it, and it literally changed my life um, and just opened up a whole other avenue. And so since I had that new tool and that ability, I was like, you know, I want to make an album that would be the equivalent of if I were putting out an album in 1993, what album would I put out? Like, how would my debut album be? So I made, I started making the album as far as production it sounds with that type of aesthetic, with real dope classic vocal samples, a little bit of like early 90s ragamuffin, like super cat. Like, I'm really into that stuff. So, like, has some of that in there, some roots, some hip hop, like good classic scratching, just really just cool. Like, it's a cool hip hop album. It's like a golden era hip hop album with just content that's relevant to now and, and beyond. Um, so I did that, and so I decided I wanted to do a Kickstarter album because how fresh would it be if you're in 1993 to put out your album and have colored vinyl, right? Souls of Mischief had blue, Raekwon had pur you know, purple, Master Ace had gold. So I did a Kickstarter campaign to raise enough money to press my album to double colored vinyl. And I was going to do one yellow, one blue for Golden State. And so fortunately, I raised enough money to do it. And so... Yeah, big up to all the supporters who did that. Big up to Arnett Eyewear, who really helped. They contributed as well. Um, now the dilemma is I sent it to a record pressing place, and they sent it back asking me to give them the sheet of all my samples and the proof that I've cleared it. So that's the new era of issues that we're dealing with now. Because in 93, the pressing plant was like, I don't, I'll press anything. Now the major labels, since they are having a hard time making money off of their shit, they are really looking at other ways to make money. And so they're going after people who are illegally using their samples or catalog. So now they even go after the music, the record pressing plant, saying that if they sell me my records, that's technically a commercial sale. Wow. So it's crazy. I just found that out like a, like a month or two ago. So now I'm looking for a cool independent punk label like Bill Smith Records or somebody who will press my album without asking all those questions. Yeah, go, go like hip hop used to else. do. Like like hip hop used to do. Give you one of these. Right. Um, and shout out to, to all the punk rock heads too. I know this is undergroundhiphopblog.com, yeah, but man. just independent, just good music. It doesn't matter what style it is. You know the whole lifestyle thing, skateboarding, graph. We touched on music. Let's talk about uh, FME culture. I wanted to talk about that. FME culture. You can go to fmeculture.com. It's basically um, the new man of. It's like the my original company is called FME, which is Funny Man Entertainment. And it basically was a tour management management company. And as we managed Dell, we've done li liaison work for different cats, ranging from Rest in Peace Rock Raider to Souls of Mission to AC Alone, all these different cats like that. Um, and then over the last five or six years, we flipped it and kind of become a culture and lifestyle marketing firm, which is all that rah-rah pretty much means is just finding ways to sustain and grow the relationship between independent artists and the like-minded industries and brands so they can work together and coexist. Like, you know, Dell's music has always been a big influence in skateboarding videos and snowboarding videos. So knowing that, FME Culture now will seek out these brands that represent that same aesthetic and partner Dell up with the brands like Plan B Skateboards, you know, like Arnett Eyewear, and we do projects with them, collab, offer them music, we do a lot of co-branding and events and stuff like that. So that's now a service that I don't just do for like Dell, but I do that with other artists and work with it and help because that way it allows artists who are not getting the marketing exposure that they'd get from a label spending the money because labels aren't spending money marketing. Um, it's a way for them to get marketing exposure through video games, through skateboard companies, pretty much how independent hip hop has sustained over the years. You know, like those, that crowd and those repetitious you know, listens when someone's watching a skate video, you watch it over and over again. And you start associating that part in the video with that song. And all of a sudden you get these kids who are like between 11 and 18 turned on to Dell at an earlier age and they're working their way up. And that's kind of what happened in the early 90s. So we do that. And so we just provide that service because right now, you know, the record industry is not spending money marketing someone's album, which means their album sells less and less and less. And what the, what the record label will say, well, we can't spend much marketing your album because we can't guarantee people aren't going to download it versus buy it. So um, you're going to have to tour to make, the, make your money and promote your album. But what happens is, is everybody got that same message. So now you have three times as many acts touring all the time, plus bands getting back together because money's tight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
And then you get super groups merging to try to get that money too. So you have all these different acts and what's happening is markets are getting saturated. There's, you know, before you'd say in one market there may be 10 hip hop shows a month and you'd have at every hip hop show, all the hip hop heads would move to one show to another, right? Now you may have 15 or 20, so halves going here, some going there. So what happens then? You know, the promoter spends this amount of guarantee and they lose money. And so what they do next time, give you a lower guarantee and lower their marketing and lower theirs until where they're pretty much like, well, shit, I hope you are, have a good relationship with your fans and not a market and promote and get your name out. Because basically now a promoter is pretty much just hosting your show. Yeah, it's just Facebook invite. Yeah. I'm a promoter. And they just do like a, a calendar, a 30-day calendar with all their dates, and that's it. So with that loss of marketing, a lot of artists are suffering. Their guarantees are going down, and it's kind of hurting. So we saw that happening, and we just said, you know, we need to get more marketing. And we understood that our, our marketing and our, our growth is not going to come from the record industry. It's going to come from these, the industries that really have always supported us. When you go to Dell shows, you see skateboarders, you see, you see b-boys, you see all those cats. We get, we get booked out in like Colorado in the mountain towns. Why? Because of snowboarders and ski. All those cats are into it. So why not go work with those cats directly and get music, empower them, get music in their videos, because they want the music, let's give it to them. Let's not, let's not worry about negotiating the price right now, like, just use it, because we benefit from that. And that's how we sustain and grow. So that's pretty much the essence of that. But the, you know, the, the cult, FME culture, the culture is like graffiti, music, business, and the relativeness of all of that. Utilizing everybody in that cog as a partner. Like We can't treat promoters like they're op opposition. Everybody from the artist to the manager to the producer to the DJ to the promoter to the business person, we all need to work together because this, this culture does not function without any one of those. And I tell artists when I talk about when they do consulting and talk to other artists, like, look, you got to treat the promoters like a partner because they're trying to stay in business. And yeah, some of them are hella shady, but so are some hella rappers. And some, it was like, yes, there are bad humans. But you got to work with the ones that you work with and empower them. Promoters go away. Guess who becomes a promoter? You do. Hope you have a Fab Five Freddy in your click or somebody cuz next thing you know somebody's going to put up money. Somebody's going to have to promote it. And you know, you really start realizing if you, if it goes to that point how much you the promoter does for you. And the same thing, I talked to your promoter and be like you got to realize these artists are, you know. Yeah. So you but we got to work together. Times are not easy. Not not hell people aren't caking up. So the, the FME culture is about the unification of all of those and making it function so both business and music can sustain in a, in a quality culture way, not just a pop way, yeah. you know? That's so much knowledge for the artists out there, too. I mean, you guys got to really break that down, sit back, watch this a couple times, make sure you get it. It's FMEculture.com. Check it out. It's good catching up with you, Buku. Yeah, appreciate it. Peace. Thank you, guys. Pause one. UndergroundHipHopBlog.com. Peace. What's up? This is the skateboarding, strike bowling, graffiti writing lyricist known as Boo Cool One. You're here with UndergroundHipHopBlog.com. Stay tuned, stay focused, and stay engaged. Peace. UndergroundHipHopBlog.com exclusive.